When building a homebrew rig, one of the things you'll want to incorporate is an ALC circuit and some method of uh, protecting the final amplifier from a high SWR. Uh, my homebrew rig has a meter with a uh, forward power and a reverse power indicator built in. Uh, here I have the rear of the rig where I've pulled the 100 watt PA amplifier off the back. It feeds some low pass filters and a Stockton uh, forward and reflected power bridge. The power bridge feeds this 100 watt 30 dB attenuator. That's uh, my dummy load. Uh, this is the Stockton bridge which, uh, from which I derive forward power and reflector power. Uh, those two signals are, uh, are then fed into a, an LM3900 ALC and SWR processing circuit. This processing circuit is derived from the RSGB handbook and is a design by G3TSO. Uh, it consists of a, an LM3900. Uh, reflected power and forward power are fed into the uh, operational uh, amplifiers inside the chip and the output of the chip is then used to control the drive to the final PA. In this rig I'm using an AD603 in the transmitter lineup. It's fed from some uh, band uh, pass filters which are fed from a transmit mixer which, trans which mixes the 9 meg single side band with the VFO to produce an output on whatever band I require. The gain of the AD603 is controlled by applying a voltage varying from 4.5 for full output down to 3.5 volts. This uh, 1 volt change gives me uh, approximately a 40 dB change in gain. I use that from a manual drive control as well as that the pin also receives a voltage from the ALC and the SWR protection circuitry. Here is a view of the LM3900 ALC and SWR processing. The Stockton bridge is down here, puts out a forward and a reflected power signal which goes to this uh, circuit board. A couple of trim pots, I can adjust the level of the two signals into the LM3900 plus a bias uh, control which sets the DC level of the ALC output to match the AD603 gain control pin. So I've now switched the transmitter on and I'm going to bring the drive up till I get to around the 50 watt mark. And then I'm going to uh, adjust the ALC trim pot to uh, show you the effect of the adjustment. I'm uh, now winding the trim pot back and you'll see the power drop off. There we go, now down to 10 watts. And back up to 50 and I'll swing up to the waveform monitor or the crow and I'll show you the drop in power. There we go, it's uh, maintaining a nice sine wave and back up to around 50 watts. So with that setting, um, if the RF power uh, exceeds 50 watts, the ALC will pull it back and maintain the 50 watt level. Now the next thing I want to test is the SWR detector. Now the idea of that is to protect the final transistors should the SWR be too high. Now we need some method of producing some SWR which is controlled. What I have here is a second 100 watt 50 ohm attenuator, 30 dB attenuator and by connecting the two 50 ohm uh, loads across the transmitter output I've now produced a 25 ohm load for the transmitter. A 25 ohm load should produce an SWR or standing uh, SWR of around 2 to 1. So I should be able to go to my SWR setting and see an SWR of 2 to 1. So I switch the transmitter on and I'll now bring the drive up and I'm also switched to reflected power on my meter. So as I bring the drive up you'll see some reflected power which wasn't there when the load was 50 ohms. And what I'm going to do now is adjust the SWR protection circuit so that the power will start to be pulled back should the SWR get higher than around about 2, maybe 2.5 to 1. So here I'm adjusting the SWR, the trim pot, and you'll see the reading on the SWR, the reflected power falling as I'm adjusting. In other words, I'm pulling the uh, RF power back. If I go to forward, you'll see it uh, getting pulled back as I adjust it. So the SWR circuit is now pulling the power back. Okay, I can go back up so that the um, SWR can be a little bit higher. I might, maybe I'd, I wanted to pull in maybe at around about there, maybe just above 2 to 1 or 2.5 to 1. So when the SWR gets to 2.5 to, to 1, 
um, I'd like the power on the uh, uh, transmitter to be uh, pulled back. Here's a view of the waveform. As I pull the power back, you'll see the uh, amplitude. Um, 2 volts peak to peak there represents around 10 watts and uh, my uh, forward power meter is reading 10 watts at this stage. I'll now set the SWR to actually start protecting when the SWR is around 2.5 to 1 which is around there. So both the ALC and the SWR protection circuits are now being set up on this transceiver. I've used 50 watts as the point at which the ALC kicks in. Um, simply because I, I don't want to run it at full power in case the SWR system wasn't working. Now, prior to doing these tests with RF power going through the Stockton Bridge, what I did was I, I put a DC voltage on the output of the Stockton Bridge feeding the ALC and SWR circuitry. And by varying the voltage I could determine whether or not that circuit was controlling the uh, signal coming out of the AD603. That way I knew that all of my circuitry would work. The only thing to do next was to put RF through it. I've kept the power at 50 watts because if the SWR is 2 to 1 you don't really want to get to 100 watts. Um, the idea of the SWR protection circuit is to protect your transistors. You really don't want to do it too, too many times. Um, you really want to try and find out why the SWR is so high. So the SWR should kick in and pull your transmitter power and then you should investigate what's going on. The ALC on the other hand is there to just simply limit the peak power and I can set the ALC to kick in at around about 100 watts. So, uh, But for these tests I stayed on 50 watts simply because with a 25 ohm load on the 100 watt amplifier going to 100 watts is not a very good idea. Uh, simply because I'm going through the process of, of setting it all up. Once it's set up um, then of course you can operate the amplifier at the higher power and if your SWR is 1 to 1 that's not a problem. If it's 2 to 1 or higher then the SWR circuit will pull the power back to 50 watts or even some lower value whatever you you've decided is a is a good value to to hold. One thing I would like to mention about the use of the LM3900 my uh, circuitry uses a genuine uh, device that I purchased locally. I did buy a batch of 10 off eBay and I found out of that batch of 10 only one or two actually worked. They're so bad in fact that if you have a close look here you will see that there, for example this one here has two dimples. One slightly deeper, deeper than the other. Others have one dimple and none at all. This particular one here has a very thin dimple there and on the end which is, I presume represents pin 1 there's no there's no, no indication at all. That one doesn't work. Most of these do not work. My recommendation is if you're going to buy them from eBay um, you might find that, they, that a lot of them won't work. They're all, they're all uh, they just don't work properly. Some don't work at all. Some give uh, uh, the wrong voltages and, and it's just quite disappointing. They weren't very expensive, but they're also uh, rubbish. Just for interest, here's the bottom view of the homebrew rig. A pair of VFOs. Uh, they consist of the SI5351 phase lock loop chips, and they are driven by a pair of Arduino Omega 2650 processors. The output of the two VFOs feeds a series of low-pass filters, which, switch, which are switched in for each uh, band segment. Uh, the rig covers from... Uh, 100 kilohertz up to 54 megahertz and these filters are uh, switched in for the appropriate band. The receiver is full coverage. The transmitter is prevented from transmitting outside the amateur bands by a uh, logic system inside the processors. And this is the transmit enable. The, uh, down here we have the mode selection, upper side band, lower side band, FM, CW, etc. And some relay systems which are used to control VFOs uh, antenna selection uh, and other things. The two, v uh, two VFOs are totally independent and the reason for that is that the second VFO is designed to drive a spectrum display independent of the main VFO. Uh, I didn't really want to do it through a series of menus on the one processor although that's possible. I, I prefer to have two separate VFOs. The, uh, the cost of the Arduinos and the chips are not very, not very high but it does make the system a little bit more complex.